Hi, all online people. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, so do you both have materials you want to share on the screen? I have a PowerPoint. This yeah, I, I do too. Okay, great. Um, so we'll stop sharing this image that you see right now a little bit closer to time, which I guess time is zooming by. Um, and you both have screen share access, so you should be able just to pull it up whenever you're ready. Um, great, and we you. can maybe, because um, I think you're all the speakers are virtual, we can maybe move the camera a little bit so you can see all of the audience. Um, okay. Great, cool. That sounds Thank good. You.
Hello, can you hear me? Jerry, hi. Hello. Can you see me as well? I can. You can, okay. I'm wondering whether we should start. It's 4.30. Hi, all of you online, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and let you all yeah. share your screen. Hello, can everybody hear me? Can I see like a thumbs up? I can see people in the audience. Ah, all right. Thank you so much. Um, that's great. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, I think you can see my side profile because I've got my own um, computer up here. Um, let me just uh, okay, let's get started right. Um, can you see my first slide? No? Okay. No. All right. Can you see it now? No, I'm sorry. All right. I think you should be able to see it now. Um, okay, so um, my name is uh, Radhika, and um, let me just go into. Yeah, I still can't see your slides, um, Radhika. All right, um, and um, I'm actually um, um, from Singapore. I'm, I'm from Singapore, and I'm doing this remotely. So it's four thirty a.m. in the morning here. Uh, in Singapore. And today we'll talk to you about um, uh, how we revamped uh, a writing curriculum at my university, which is uh, the Singapore Institute of Technology. Um, and I'm with the Center for Communication Skills. Uh, we revamped it from a, um, an existing uh, curriculum, which offered um, various types of writing modules to something that um, was a little bit more a curriculum, which was more enriched in writing, um, because we found that that's what our students needed. Um, let me move on from there. Okay. Okay. Is that helping? Right. Okay. So the Singapore Institute of Technology was officially set up in 2014 to offer degrees in all of these things, engineering, food and tech, biotechnology, infocom, uh, and then we do have business communication and design. And under the business cluster or this cluster, uh, we've got things like accountancy and so on. Uh, and then we have the health and social sciences cluster. We call them clusters instead of faculties. Uh, but you'll notice that there is a predominance of uh, STEM sort of uh, degree programs. Um, and um, in 2015, the Center for Communication Skills was set up to design and offer communication skills modules um, to students in all of these above uh, mentioned programs. Now, that in, uh, the, these, skill, these modules included both writing and presentation skills, um, as well as uh, what we call as uh, professional communication. Um, so basically we had individual modules, uh, which were usually technical writing and effective communication, meaning that they included things like um, uh, proposal writing um, and um, presentation skills as well. Those were called the technical writing and effective communication. And then we had, we also offered um, something called career and professional development um, in many of the programs. And these included, uh, or this module included things like resume writing, um, job interview skills, and so on. Um, but the thing is that these two types, module types, were not offered in all of the programs, um, just in some. The, we had we also offered embedded writing instruction in content modules in a few programs based on ad hoc requests from content faculty uh, through what we called communicating across the curriculum, uh, which began sometime in 2016. 
So, and these were usually offered to those programs that didn't have either of these um, uh, modules. Then we had something called, uh, we still have this, the CCS, which is CCS refers to Center for Communication Skills, CCS Help Desk, an online reservation system that students could use to book a slot for consultation on their writing. And that was at the time with a CCS faculty member, a full-time faculty member. Um, we also had e-micro modules that offered self-directed instruction and activities on selected language uh, elements. And, but there were a few just, you know, as sparse, uh, maybe two or so. Um, so that was the situation at that time. Um, so the reality was that not all programs had a writing module uh, and the offering was decided based on space and time in content curriculum. And usually this was decided by the um, content professors. Um, the existing technical writing and effective communication modules comprise different combinations of writing genre instruction based on the types of assignments in their content curriculum. It could be proposal and report writing. Some of them had literature review writing, some had critiques and so on. Um, the other thing was that they were taught in different years, not necessarily in the first year uh, of their degree programs, um, largely based on availability of time and space in the content curriculum. Um, they ranged from three weeks to 20 weeks of instruction, but with a lot of times with similar learning outcomes um, and expectations by the content professors, which meant that um, our tutors had to cover the same number of topics and administer three to five assignments, regardless of whether the, the modules were run over three weeks or six weeks or 20 weeks. Um, and each of these modules were weighted differently with credits ranging from three to five. So as you can see, it was a bit of a hodgepodge and, you know, um, well, I, I would say a little bit of a mess there. Um, so as a result, students' ability to write um, content assignments, or at least, well, as a result is, you know, sort of assuming a lot, but, you know, um, the situation was that students' ability to write content assignments, capstone projects, and honors dissertations was widely disparate. Even students who had taken the, the technical writing and effective communication module in one, first year or second year were not competent writers of capstone projects, honors dissertations in their year four, or reflective reports on their work attach, attachments, um, which they did in, at the end of year two or year three. Um, well, it dawned upon us that clearly we were not doing this right, but we wanted more evidence to show that we needed change. Um, so here are some of the some of the students' reflections, selected students' reflections on writing issues that students had. Um, you can have a look at these. Some, you know, there was one student who said, I understand that there is a structure that needs to be implemented in crafting reports proposals, requests, etc. Uh, however, I find it challenging to make the different segments flow effortlessly with one another. Uh, another one said, I'm ashamed of my ability to write reports as I get overwhelmed with content. Um, and then uh, my weakness um, is that I do not word my intentions very well. There are times when I try to explain a concept or make uh, a comment on things, but my peers would interpret what I say uh, in a different way. Um, I still struggle with expressing my thoughts clearly, whether they be written or spoken. This could be due to overthinking or a lack of straightforward thought process. And finally, one of my goals is to better understand strategies behind refined professional writing so that I can write, I can apply that to my writing skills in the future. So these are just very few. Uh, there were lots of others, um, but we um, sort of you know went on to to do more, and that is to get feedback from industry practitioners who supervised our students on their attachment. Um, 
we thought it would be good it would be a good idea to get you know information from so called the horse's mouth because um, these are places where our students went to do their uh, what we call as the integrated work study program um, which is quite long for our students uh, it's anything from 6 months to a year um, so here are some of the comments the quotes from um, different people uh, the first one is uh, somebody from, uh, he's an engineering manager at something at a place called Cleantech Solar. We need in our industry ability to read and analyze content and then explain it in writing and speech to someone. They may be asked to research something and then present it to me in summary, clearly and simply laid out and useful. So that says a lot about uh, thought processes, structure, um, and clarity. Um, chemical engineer said documentation writing is needed, writing of installation operation manuals, explaining the problem and what you're doing to troubleshoot in very simple terms to the client who may not be an engineer. So audience, um, you know, uh, and um, uh, the sort of particular kind of genre here. Um, this was from a, the group chief nurse of uh, the Singapore General Hospital because we also have uh, programs, we run programs, a degree program for nurses. Nurses are often unable to write succinctly, especially when reporting patient status to doctors. They need training in writing, reader-centered, complete documents, uh, what has been done and what other stakeholders need to know. Uh, the kind of treatment that uh, patients have been given in other administered to patients. Being digital natives, they need to be taught how to write formal texts. These were her words, uh, devoid of social media lingo. Um, nurses routinely write incident reports in their course of work. So that was again, a uh, kind of genre that they were expecting. Uh, doctors often complain that reports contain too much information. Um, so conscious decision on uh, you know, how to write concisely. Um, so all of these were expectations by these um, people in the various industries who actually supervised our students. And the final one is uh, somebody from food regulatory, uh, the food technology industry, um, who said, beware of the tone of your messages in emails. Work performance is important, but images is important too. Um, things like showing empathy, of course, this is a little bit about, you know, um, spoken, the spoken element, uh, but who also, but he also said that students have to be mindful about making absolute statements in their emails or in their reports, uh, as there's new information coming out all the time. So I have to, in my mind, I was thinking, because I teach writing, you know, like knowing how to hedge, knowing how to put things across in a way that in the event that other, other things come up, uh, you can explain yourself. Um, so, so these were just some of the interviews that we conducted um, and the information gathered from both student reflections and work supervisors informed us that we needed a new writing curriculum that should provide instruction and practice in all of these um, types of texts students would be needing to write both at university and beyond um, that were customized to the different for the different programs. Common understanding assumptions within groups uh, that that we are that you're writing for, you know, um, an awareness of that. Importance of domain expertise. Um, know that you need to know your content well in order to be able to write um, content. Um, writing process knowledge, paragraphing, text flow, you know, use of connectors, and all the rest of that as well as rhetorical knowledge, audience on audience, purpose, tone, and so on. You could be writing the same thing to different stakeholders, and some of them could be in your uh, area of um, content knowledge or not. Uh, they could be in the wider circle or completely out of that circle. Um, so, and we needed to, to, to design um, a curriculum in a way that students would find engaging and useful because they could apply the knowledge and skills immediately to writing their content assignments uh, and hopefully beyond. Um, so 
Around that time as well, senior management, the president of the university, uh, expressed that we may want to consider incorporating critical thinking in our module. And we found this, you know, the Washington State University project in 2001 had identified seven elements of critical thinking that they viewed as being standard across university programs. And these uh, were what they included, problem identification, establishment of a clear perspective on the issue, um, you know, recognition of alternative perspectives, context, uh, eval identification and evaluation of evidence, um, an awareness of assumptions, um, either implicit or stated, and the ability to assess implications and potential conclusions. And we found that this fitted in really well with many of the types of writing that students had to do in most of our STEM programs. Um, you know, the science, engineering, and our universities uh, offers predominantly those types of uh, programs, as you would have noticed in my first or second slide. Um, so we figured that we could get, we could actually get students to apply critical thinking skills to analyze texts by genre, discourse community, um, content knowledge, um, you know, especially you know, validity of the content knowledge because so much of there's so much of AI generated texts now with chat GPT and other such software. Um, writing process knowledge and rhetorical knowledge. So the critical thinking skills might be useful, we thought, for them to be able to um, analyze other, other people's writing, like critically evaluate, and then as well as their own writing when they were um, writing their own assignments. So, uh, yeah, so the challenge then was to find a critical thinking model that was easy to understand and could be applied repeatedly to writing texts in new contexts, which is what we wanted. We were thinking of transfer, you know, the ability to take you know, the knowledge beyond first year into their second, third year, and hopefully into their um, uh, attachments as well. So we chose the Paul Elder critical thinking model as it seemed to lend itself best to comprehending, analyzing and writing STEM type of texts, mainly because it came with a set of questions that students could use to guide their writing uh, or their thinking and writing and um, use it like a checklist as well. Um, so going forward, in, in 2020, 21, the, the, um, the academic year, we offered a new uh, four credit, 48 hour, 12 week module entitled Critical Thinking and Communicating because there was a little bit of presentation skills at the end um, where students presented their group proposals, but most of it was really writing intensive. Um, and this emphasized critical thinking in writing in year one for all undergraduate programs. So um, thankfully, we got the support of senior management to, and to sort of, you know, have this module taught across all programs. How am I for time? Okay. Um, customize the module to suit the writing outcomes in each program using backward curriculum design or understanding by design so that students could immediately apply the knowledge and skills they were learning. Uh, in this module to their content assignments in year one through types of scenarios, assignments, uh, and the uh, assignments used to assess. Um, yeah, so I'll, I think I need to go through very quickly now, probably backward curriculum design to contextualize teaching and assessment. So the dis we had discussions, many, many discussions with content professors uh, using some of these questions, you know, uh, it helped us to, um, to de design our, our the, the um, module to customize uh, the modules for each of the different programs. It was a lot of work, but I think it, it was helpful because eventually the content professors um, found that it could work as well. So I'm going to go pretty quickly now. I think I won't go into this part because it actually just talks about the critical thinking. Um, what it did and how we were going to sort of the kind of things that we were going to use for our students. Um, the Paul Elder critical thinking framework basically looks at these 
And we thought that if this would be useful, we can use it to sort of help them to analyze their own content, uh, as well as to look at their own writing, um, to see whether there was purpose there, um, you know, ask relevant questions, uh, were the points of view expressed clearly, was there enough information, assumptions, all of these things. Um, all right, I will skip through this as well. So these were the questions that we used, we, we shared with the students and we told them that you can use these as a, as a guide, uh, both to uh, critique when you're doing a, a reader response, as well as when you're writing your own assignment. Um, some examples of the types of writing activities. I'll just share one with you. This was for the uh, robotics program. So um, we'd give them like a student written summary reader response and um, ask them to annotate it in a way that helps them to understand it. And here we told them that you could use your um, Paul Elder framework, the questions to, to guide you to um, to sort of understand the text better. Um, yeah, this was the kind of form that we gave them to sort of uh, write in their answers. And then, of course, they did peer reviews. Um, all right, this is another one um, that we used for uh, the program entitled Digital Communication and Integrated Media, uh, where they had to write an advertising proposal on the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Uh, they had to watch a video and then use the Paul Elder framework to examine the following um, in that Green Plan. Um, a, there was a lot of text in the video as well. So the assumptions, et cetera, et cetera, all of these, and then share their findings with the class. Um, but we found that um, the writing module in year one was really not enough because by the time um, they come to year two, year three, and so on, where they had to write other kinds of texts, um, they would have forgotten what they had learned in year one. So we didn't have the luxury of providing or offering separate writing modules throughout students' programs due to lack of time and space and, you know, but we needed something to help them to connect the dots. So what we did was to embed, all right, through what we call as communicating across the curriculum, assignment specific writing instruction in at least one content module per academic year from year two till graduation in every undergraduate program to reiterate writing knowledge. And we managed to get senior management to support us with this. Um, and the different kinds of CAC were like these, a critique of the healthcare system. So what we did was to pick up on the skills, the knowledge and the, the writing knowledge and skills taught in the first year module, and, um, and then use those to build on new skills like writing a, a critique, a laboratory report, um, an essay, a discursive essay, on food sustainability, a systematic literature review, um, and add on to, to that via uh, short writing instructions, like workshops that we held within content time um, in the different years. Um, so in a sense, well, it was to help kind of scaffold the transfer. Um, so all of the programs had to submit a communication skills plan that captured the kind of follow-up communication instruction, mostly writing instruction that students will be needing. Um, waiting, we managed to get management to weight this um, up to 15 or 15% 15 um, to the writing, mostly writing actually, presentation skills. All we do is sit in on the assessment with the content professors. Um, so the CAC now accounts for three credits in every academic year, beginning from year two um, of a student's undergraduate education at SIT. Right, so some of the challenges, this is my last slide actually, um, was of course having to manage content professors' frustration that they have to give up precious time in their curriculum for compulsory CAC sessions because it's over and above the first year module. 
Uh, but we again sat with them and explained that, look, you're going to get much better quality writing as a result of this. And uh, your work supervisors are going to be happier with students when we put them out there and they have to actually start writing reports and things. Um, and so getting them to submit the requests for embedded writing instructions took some time because we got we asked them to submit them to us at least eight weeks in advance so we could prepare materials. Um, CAC writing instruction is assignment specific and therefore discipline specific. So getting tutors to sort of work and prepare themselves for the task with content knowledge, work with content professors on writing assessment rubrics was a bit of a challenge as well. Uh, it still is, we're working on it. Um, getting a large pool of, um, I'm sorry, AF simply means adjunct faculty uh, or part-time people with the right experience and attitude to run these workshops because we can't, we can't do it. We're a fairly lean um, uh, department. And of course, managing all the CAC requests from different degree programs. So these were some of the challenges that we faced. Okay, I've now come to the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think I've eaten into <laughs> some, some of your time. Yes. Um, yes, please, please carry on. Should I stop I think, sharing? Uh, I, I think I might be next. Are you um, right? Yeah. I'm not sure if, you know, we have a certain order we prefer. Do, do we have- Go, go ahead, Kristen. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go in the order of the program then. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kristen. Um, so I'm, I'm currently a preceptor in the writing program at Harvard and I'll be starting um, at MIT in the fall. Um, I'll be talking today about um, some work that I did um, interviewing and um, with students at Harvard who are STEM concentrators about their experiences with writing. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and just kind of confirm that, you know, we can all see it. Um, does this seem visible to everyone? Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, my presentation today is called Towards the New Pedagogy of Transfer Across the Discipline Supporting Underprepared Student Writers in STEM. Um, and before I get deep into the, the talk here, I want us to, to just kind of familiar, familiarize yourselves with my um, study a little bit. So um, all of the students that I spoke with took the studio sequence um, at Harvard, which is for underprepared student writers based on a, an assessment um, that they take uh, before coming to Harvard. Uh, and I conducted 30 interviews with both underclassmen and upperclassmen in science, math, engineering, and computer science. Um, this particular presentation that I'm giving today focuses on a smaller subset of students that I did follow-up interviews with um, who were who talk specifically a lot about the challenges of being a first generation student um, while also um, concentrating in in stem um, after taking the studio sequence at Harvard so that's my particular population here um, so what I was most interested in is you know what skills do these first generation students feel they need to perform well in stem concentrations um, some of the um, literature that I'm drawing on here is the idea of leading activity, which comes from cognitive science. It's the idea that, you know, what is what is at the forefront of the minds of these students and that what they talk about kind of the most to really emphasize in these interviews is, is what they're what they tend to be kind of struggling with or working the hardest to try to um, improve on. Um, and, uh, you know, I was also as someone who teaches you know, first year writing classes interested in like if students were able to see a connection between what we were doing in the first year writing classroom and the kinds of course it, coursework they were getting um, in their STEM specific classes that um, year or later on. Um, and this I think is important because uh, many students, you know, believe they wouldn't use all of their writing related knowledge unless an assignment required it. Um, 
so that's context for for my study. Um, and now I'm just going to to read a part of my talk. Um, so the writing needs of first generation students and STEM concentrations remain overlooked compared to continuing education peers. First generation college students are underrepresented in math, science, engineering, and computer science. Yet research indicates that the percentage of first generation students pursuing college more generally has increased over the years, with the Center for First Generation Student Success reporting that over 50% of undergraduates have parents without a bachelor's degree. As more first generation students enter college classrooms, it is important to understand the barriers that this population faces and the factors that contribute to retention in STEM subjects. Many first generation students enter college attracted to STEM fields uh, because they associate these fields with financially stable careers. However, these students are also more likely to change majors or leave STEM programs compared to continuing education peers. So a lot of previous research has focused heavily on factors that uh, influence retention like GPA, math preparation. Um, but what I'm most interested in here is the extent to which um, scientific literacy and genre specific disciplinary knowledge can impact first generation student self efficacy in these STEM courses. So in this presentation, I'm going to share results from the case, case study uh, project that arises out of this larger project. Um, so I'm focusing on three students here, um, and they're all first generation students at different stages of, of their careers, and obviously I've changed the names. Um, so two, two of the students that I interviewed, Jonah and Amanda, and I'll go into more depth on this, express difficulty learning the conventions of scientific writing and applying this knowledge to produce original content of their own. The third student, Robert, felt much more confident tackling problem sets, reports, and other projects in his classes, uh, possibly because he had taken relevant courses at a community college and entered the university with a basic familiarity of the material that the other two students lacked. So uh, what I want to suggest is that instructors can lay the groundwork necessary for self-efficacy um, in intro level writing courses by exposing students to strategies for making sense of unfamiliar reading and content and to different types of, of right, disciplinary writing in STEM specifically. Um, so several studies indicate that first generation students are significantly uh, underrepresented in, in STEM and, and scholars credit this problem to the unique challenges that they face while pursuing a college education. Some of these barriers include uh, limited extracurricular involvement, more work commitments, uh, limited background knowledge or familiarity with college expectations and norms. Many of these factors have been shown to be statistically significant when it comes to retention in a STEM field and degree um, completion. In one study, a student's math, ground, math background was predictive of retention, um, but also other factors, and including the extent to which the student interacts with faculty were also significant. So for me, it's really important to understand the confluence of factors that influence first generation students' experiences in the STEM classroom, and to try to think about through writing assignments, through writing instruction, are there ways to, to support this population um, in ways that haven't been done before or aren't done as regularly. So um, I wanna start with Jonah. Um, so at the time of the study, Jonah had recently finished his first year of college where he enrolled in the year long introductory writing course sequence. So at Harvard, you can take one semester or a year long course depending on um, you know, the placement process and how the first semester goes. Um, and two STEM courses, including classes in chemistry and environmental engineering. Jonah's plan is to major in environmental engineering, and he wants to work for the government to find more sustainable approaches to agriculture. 
When reflecting on the range of assignments that he encountered in these STEM courses, particularly lab reports, Jonah reported considerable frustration, noting that he had difficulty determining the structure and content expected in this genre of writing. Jonah attributed some of this frustration to the preparation he received in high school, especially when, when it came to exposing students to the nuts and bolts of scientific writing. Describing his experiences, Jonah stated, quote, the only things I ever really wrote in high school were fictional. So I still catch myself doing that in the middle of my lab report. I will write sentences like, it was as green as the meadows day to describe a solution, for example. Very poetic writing. Jonah indicated that he found it difficult to adjust to the language of science writing because his high school education had not introduced him to it. In his conversations with me, Jonah described his first collegiate lab report assignment and environmental engineering in detail, focusing particularly on the difficulty he had learning the conventions of the genre and organizing his ideas. I think my score was a 30%, he noted. For our first lab, we did the experiment and then they were like, write a lab report. And I did what I thought was needed, but everyone did it differently because the majority of the class was full of first year, so we didn't have much groundwork. While the instructor encouraged students to redo this assignment, he told me students did not receive a template or set of requirements for the revised lab report. So while Jonah appreciated the chance to take another stab at it, he found the revision process unclear. This is an experience that Jonah believed other students in the class also found frustrating due to unfamiliarity with the genre of the lab report, which I think is a genre that many instructors may actually assume students do all throughout high school. But in the case of many of the first gen students that I interviewed was, was definitely not the case. Um, okay, Amanda. Um, so unlike Jonah, Amanda was ready to graduate from college at the time of her second interview with a degree in neuroscience. Throughout her time in college, she had taken the same two semester sequence in first year writing that Jonah enrolled in, but she also took an elective ungraded mini course on science writing as a freshman with the goal of establishing a better understanding of the conventions of writing in the sciences before a research paper required for an introductory life sciences course. Amanda's experiences shed light on the importance of cultivating a sense of scientific identity and belonging early on in college for STEM interested first generation students. Throughout her time in college, Amanda stated that she often struggled with confidence and suspected that her peers were more familiar with scientific concepts than she was. While reflecting on writing weekly discussion board posts for a neuroscience course, Amanda admitted, I found those pretty intimidating because a lot of my classmates made really sophisticated points or found things that I definitely didn't. I think STEM papers are really hard to read and analyze, sometimes for a variety of reasons. There's just so many moving parts. I found it helpful to take notes and ask questions like, why did they do this experiment? What are these graphs? What is this saying? For Amanda, the complexity of the scientific research articles that she was asked to read and post about on the discussion forum contributed to an overall sense of unease and concern that everyone can do this a lot better than she could. Amanda had no prior exposure to scientific research articles in high school, and in fact, she admitted that it was not until her junior year of college that she became comfortable reading and interpreting the findings in these kinds of articles. These anxieties about reading scientific articles translated to the writing process for Amanda as her instructors emphasize reading the literature in order to design an experiment that is completely new or addresses a gap. Amanda found this process incredibly time consuming, indicating that generating ideas this way involved finding and reading sections of quote, anywhere from 50 to 100 papers. She summarized, quote, if you don't know what you're doing, I think it can be even more than that. It is clear that Amanda constantly battled the feeling that she was entering the classroom at a disadvantage because, uh, compared to her continuing education peers. At the level of reading, the sense that peers understood the articles better and were able to isolate more interesting points from them made it difficult for her to feel confident contributing to discussions. At the writing level, the same concern over the limits of her scientific knowledge as a result of her high school education and the fact that she had never worked in a lab. 
made drafting proposals a common assignment in her discipline incredibly challenging. And then Robert. So Robert's educational trajectory differed considerably from Jonah and Amanda's. Robert followed a non-traditional path to university as he spent time in the military and took courses at community college for two years before enrolling. Robert's plan is to major in math or computer science, but he's still deciding which one. His goal is to work in the tech industry upon graduating. Robert's previous experiences enabled him to enter college with a higher level of self-efficacy than Jonah and Amanda, which contributed to a stronger disciplinary identity. Robert admitted that he did not take high school as seriously as he takes his studies now, it, as it was only while serving in the military that he realized he craves and cherishes intellectual conversations. Upon deciding to continue his education, Robert pursued both math and English courses in community college to build upon knowledge from high school, especially because it had been some time since he graduated from high school. He explained to me that there's a bit of a misconception about veterans in college. People believe that because they're starting their college experience later into adulthood, they have a lot of experiences and, quote, actually know more than incoming 19-year-olds. While it is true that we have the real world experience, academics are a whole different ball game, he said. Having written only five paragraph essays in high school and not having written one in several years and recognizing that calculus would be helpful for college, which was not required in his high school, Robert decided to take courses at a community college for a stronger foundation. Interestingly, the time that Robert spent in community college fostered a sense of academic identity and scientific belonging that both Amanda and Jonah struggled to find as underclassmen. For Robert, the community college courses equipped him with familiarity with mathematical and scientific concepts. It gave him a foundation for the content he would encounter in calculus in college and first year writing, even if that coursework was more involved than the material he encountered in community college. When reflecting on the math and computer science courses he took as a freshman, he said, it was difficult, but I wasn't dying. And my peers would say, you're so smart. How did you get that answer? Robert did not feel any smarter than his peers. He just felt more prepared because he had very recently applied the same skill sets in community college. This preparation gave him the confidence he needed to continue along the STEM path. When considered alongside Amanda and Jonah's experiences, Robert's reflections on background knowledge and scientific terminology suggest the importance of these two factors in shaping scientific identity. What is most notable about Robert's story is that despite the fact that he had a gap in his education and transferred into the school, he felt as if he had accumulated significant prior knowledge of math, science, and writing, which made his transition easier. When he encountered language that was unfamiliar in textbooks or lectures, he had the confidence to seek outside support in office hours or through peer tutoring, and he did not perceive using these resources as an affront to his emerging scientific identity. So I want to take a step back and think about the bigger picture here of these cases. So all three of these students' experiences reveal that if we are to support the writing needs of STEM interested first generation students, we want to think about how to expose students to the basic conventions of scientific writing in ways that foster self efficacy and the development of a disciplinary identity. So I think a lot of curriculums are uniquely positioned to, to do this work early on. Um, and I think that takes place at the level of reading and genre where a lot of students start to feel self-doubt about not knowing the conventions of a genre or not having the tools to pull apart um, a highly technical or dense, um, you know, complex scientific text. Um, those challenges mean that, you know, for these students struggle to see themselves as scholars and forge disciplinary identities. Um, and if students perceive that their peers are entering classrooms with more background knowledge and more experience writing in the sciences, more experiences with the kind of writing that's done in labs, uh, then it becomes more unlikely that they'll see themselves as part of the scientific community. So I think supporting the writing and reading needs um, of this population can go a long way in generating belonging as well as retention in STEM. 
And I just want to briefly describe my other interview data because I mentioned that this was three case studies specifically on the first generation piece of my study. Um, but my larger 30 um, subject study was was coding data, interview data with 12 categories in terms of the skills that students feel they need in their STEM concentrations. Uh, and, you know, I have analyzing, synthesizing, presenting, posing a question, summarizing, paraphrasing, locating, familiarizing, organizing, collaborating, and so on, you can see here. Uh, but what I wanna highlight is that what ended up um, being the case is that um, underclassmen mentioned analyzing and synthesizing as the skill that they need to work on the most compared to upperclassmen mentioning summarizing and paraphrasing, which seems surprising. You would think upperclassmen would be doing more analyzing, underclassmen would be doing more summarizing. But at the end of the day, it's just that this kind of rigorous analysis is very challenging for underclassmen um, and more complex summaries are being produced in STEM fields for upperclassmen. Uh, and so the implications here of all of this, I think, one, there's a tension between like, how do we teach this level of analysis, but also emphasize concision, which, which came up again and again as so important in, in writing in the sciences, but also how can we design activities and assignments that really support kind of the genre knowledge and reading needs of first generation students as well. And I'll, um, I'll pause there. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm next. Um, and, and can I ask, does anyone know, is uh, our fourth presenter? Me, I think it's Yeah, I was Neon wondering Wink that Wink. too. Doesn't yeah. look like she's here. I, I, I'm just here. checking. I don't know if, some, if she's in the, the, the physical space, um, but I have a couple of slides I could probably, they're non-essential and I, I may just kind of cut them anyway. So you may see me skip over something really quickly, just so we can have a little more quick Q and A, but also to make sure if, if she was here, I thought we might make sure uh, that they got uh, a chance to speak. Um, the okay, fourth so, person is not here. Oh, uh, okay. I'll probably skip this slide anyway. Um, just a moment here. Okay, so I'm Jerry Stinnett. Uh, I teach at Grand Valley State University. My presentation is called Whacking FYC, Making Threshold Concepts of Writing Troublesome. Uh, I'm just going to read my paper because uh, that's just what keeps me on track. I'll try to make it a little animated, though, so it doesn't feel like reading. Um, also, this is a bit more of a theoretical sort of speculative piece where I'm just kind of thinking through some ideas. So I'm very open to having this question. Um, so to begin with, a number of writing scholars have recently argued for supporting learning transfer in FYC, that's first year composition, by helping students acquire the threshold concepts of writing studies. Threshold concepts are those concepts that represent the counterintuitive expertise of a given discipline. These concepts link ideas of a discipline together, and as Phil Davies notes, reflect the, quote, deep level structure of the subject, which gives it coherence and creates a shared way of perceiving that can be left unspoken, end quote. As such, threshold concepts often appear to initiates, in David Perkins' words, as alien or foreign ways of knowing that do not fit with learners' existing paradigms of understanding. Not surprisingly, acquiring threshold concepts is challenging, commonly involving, as Cousins explains, quote, an ontological as well as conceptual shift that can be protracted over periods of time and involve oscillation between states often with temporary regression to earlier status, end quote. This uh, extended period of liminality differs between students, but can involve both serious cognitive dissonance and also take on affective dimensions, eliciting excitement, frustration, or even fear and grief. The prevailing argument for th focusing on threshold concepts in FYC runs thus. Helping students acquire writing studies threshold concepts represents a transformative rhetorical meta-awareness of writing. With this meta-awareness, students are positioned to reflect on writing situations and effectively adapt their writing skills and knowledge to those situations. This adaptability fosters effective transfer of writing-related knowledge and practice from FYC across various writing contexts. Acquiring threshold concepts of a particular discipline transforms how students see and respond to the world. 
So teaching threshold concepts of writing studies in FYC, or teaching them to acquire those concepts, would seem to transform students into rhetorically sophisticated writers able to adapt writing knowledge for their other classes. In this presentation, I argue that teaching threshold concepts of writing studies to foster transfer in FYC overlooks the role of student motivation in transformative learning. As I will show, significant student motivation is presumed by threshold concept theory. As a result, supporting transfer of learning in FYC re requires us to tap into what motivates each student to undergo the difficult process of conceptual and epistemic transformation. One way to connect rhetorical writing instruction to student motivation is to link FYC courses to the majors and professions students hope to pursue in college and beyond. Put another way, I am arguing that FYC instruction can best support transfer by using a WACWID approach. Acquisition of threshold concepts represents a change in how one sees and relates to others in the world, including others one knew prior to the transformative learning experience. As Phil Davies explains, understanding threshold concepts as, quote, ways of thinking and practicing also emphasizes the sense in which learning is an entrance into a community. The act of learning is an act of identity formation, end quote. The connection between disciplinary membership and identity formation is emphasized in Western higher education, where disciplinary membership is, at least on some level, a student choice of professional and or socioeconomic identity. As such, membership in a given discipline is often a goal for which students are significantly motivated. The very focus of threshold concept theory on successful integration into a specific discipline means that threshold concept theorists can typically presume significant student motivation in their theoretical models. Threshold concept theory, in fact, depends in its account of transformative learning on student purpose and motivation. The process of transformation that marks the acquisition of disciplinary expertise turns on the troublesome nature of threshold concepts. As Julie Timmerman observes, for transformation to happen, quote, learners must first perceive these experiences, knowledge, or phenomena to be dissonant, disorienting, or what the literature on threshold concepts has come to qualify as troublesome, end quote. This troublesome dissonance initiates the process of transformation by instigating a liminal state in which the learner perceives prior ways of knowing as insufficient or inadequate. As Meyer, Land, and Bailey point out, quote, the troublesome nature, excuse me, the troublesome knowledge inherent within the threshold concept serves here as an instigative or provocative feature which unsettles prior understanding, rendering it fluid and provoking a state of liminality, end quote. With prior understandings destabilized by the counterintuitive or troublesome character of threshold concepts, the student is moved into a liminal state, opening up the possibility of transformation into the perspective of disciplinary expertise. But the extent to which a threshold concept is troublesome and thus instigative of liminality depends directly on the learner's purposes for learning. Foreign or alien knowledge, as David Perkins explains, comes, quote, from a perspective that conflicts with our own, end quote. Any student in a given course may encounter alien or foreign knowledge, and this alien character is likely to make such knowledge troublesome. But not all foreign or alien knowledge is necessarily troublesome in the same way for everyone. Neither, thus, is it instigative of the same kinds of transformation. What represents a problem, what creates trouble, for any given student depends on the purposes the student is pursuing. A student interested only in passing a class will find alien or foreign knowledge troublesome for that purpose. But because the student's purpose is to pass the class, what is transformed by this troublesome knowledge is the student's practice of passing that class. In other words, threshold concepts do not transform students. Their acquisition represents a transformation the student has undertaken for some purpose. The extent of the transformation instigated by such troublesome knowledge is ultimately a result of the purposes and student motivations for acquiring that knowledge. Not surprisingly, ah, this is one I'll skip. I'll jump that one. Uh, importantly, threshold concept theory is a theory of successful disciplinary membership. It is precisely in this sense that threshold concept theory can presume significant student motivations connected to identity formation. The presumption of the student's desire to join a particular disciplinary or professional community 
allows threshold concept theorists and researchers to describe threshold concepts as inherently troublesome and thus inherently instigative. In other words, these theorists describe threshold concepts as inherently troublesome because they can presume student motivation that makes them troublesome. But as a requirement for all students, the FYC course does not allow instructors to assume students are motivated to learn about writing or to join the discipline of writing studies. Some students in FYC may associate their identity closely with being a writer and thus may be strongly motivated for the course. But others associate writing with the, and the FYC course with English classes that they are uninterested in. And many of these students, as has been observed in decades of composition research, see the course as a hurdle to clear and are simply motivated to get it over with. In short, the kind of motivation that makes the subject matter important to the student and thus makes threshold concepts sufficiently troublesome to broadly transform their perspective cannot be presumed for many or even most FYC students. Threshold concepts of writing studies can be taught and they can be learned, but getting students to transform their thinking and repurpose this knowledge for other courses requires that students are motivated enough about writing for these concepts to be troublesome in a broadly transformative way. To foster the transformation of student perspectives necessary to foster broad transfer in, of FYC learning, instruction must connect rhetorical awareness to activities that significantly motivate students. This means alien and foreign knowledge of writing must create trouble for activities and objectives students genuinely care about outside of the FYC course. Instructors need to frame the class as teaching students to accomplish such projects or activities. For many college students, the activities or projects associated with academic writing that will motivate them in the long term are connected to their chosen major or eventual profession. To foster writing transfer more effectively then, the FYC course should focus not on helping students write better, but on becoming a better business manager, chemist, IT professional, or graphic designer. In other words, instructors need to frame the FYC course as a course consulting students in WACWID projects. Such a framing, however, raises a number of logistical questions that may explain why transfer supportive instruction has largely ignored the question of student motivation to learn writing. One question is, what readings, activities, and assignments can FYC instructors use to tap into the motivations of 20 to 30 different students sufficiently to transform each? I suggest using activity theory to teach activity awareness rather than writing situation awareness. The basic unit of activity theory is the activity system. Activity systems are historically developing collective activities in which different agents employ tools and relationships. These activities involve divisions of labor and are, quote, oriented at a culturally significant object, which also forms the motive of the activity, quote. Individuals' participation in the activity may encompass a range of idiosyncratic motives or objectives, but the socially informed objectives that define the activity and the tools and relations used to achieve it link individual and collective purposes. Of very particular importance to activity theory is the fact that the tools, actions, and relationships of the agents within a given activity system can only be fully understood in relation to the broader activity system itself. This includes the objectives it attempts to achieve. It is the place and role of the tool in relation to the broader activity that makes its use make sense. For instance, a hammer is self-evidently used for driving nails because it is involved in the collective activity of building a house. It would become much more self-evidently a weapon were it involved in the activity of warfare. Writing always functions as a tool in a given activity system. As a result, writing is always done to accomplish an objective other than simply producing text. The fact that writing is learned and deployed within particular activities is precisely why WACWID programs exist. Writing only works within an activity and is only learned for and in a given activity system. Teaching writing in the disciplines is simply teaching writing. So developing students' meta-awareness of activities as activities rather than writing situations necessarily involves developing meta-awareness of writing. But importantly, fostering activity awareness 
makes writing instruction about the activity or objective the student values rather than requiring the student to summon up the motivation to care about writing or writing studies. Teaching activity theory as activity awareness rather than writing or writing situation awareness allows students to gain a vocabulary for reflecting on and metacognitively altering their approach to the activity. This involves thinking deliberately about the objectives, the divisions of labor, the practices, and the tools, including writing, and adapting these for different situations. And as a practice that motivates the student, activity awareness carries the potential to genuinely transform how these students see these activities. Through activity awareness, rhetorical concepts of writing, <clears throat> excuse me, through activity awareness, rhetorical concepts of writing trouble how the student achieves an objective that matters to them, not simply how they are going to pass an FYC course. The student is thus moved into a liminal state concerning much of their identity and life as it would be when joining a discipline or profession they care about. As a result, the student is transformed in how they see writing in a range of situations that make up the continuing activity. Activity theory has been used by writing scholars to theorize and teach writing meta-awareness. But in these approaches, activity theory becomes simply a way of describing writing situations in a sophisticated way. The emphasis remains on the activity of writing rather than the activities and objectives that writing supports. It is only by linking activity theory and the meta-awareness such theory provides to disciplinary or professional objectives that the student values that this meta-awareness is likely to transfer broadly beyond the FYC classroom. In my experience, students taught meta-awareness of writing tend to associate it with meta-awareness of writing assignments that they are then happy to repurpose to certain other classes. But this transfer typically takes place only to other classes in which the student thinks they are doing writing. For instance, one student of mine explicitly repurposed my FYC course for a philosophy class, but told me she did not use it for her exercise classes, or excuse me, for her exercise science classes, because they did not write in those classes. In exercise science classes, she said, quote, and this is word for word, we only write research re reports and presentations. We don't write. By framing FYC instruction as a course that teaches how to accomplish the goals of a discipline or activity the student values, instructors can make rhetorical knowledge of writing troublesome for activities students care about. This troublesomeness will in turn foster a more substantial transformation resulting in broader and more lasting transfer. By teaching my FYC classes, helping my student develop meta-awareness of exercise science projects or of being a personal trainer instead of awareness of writing, I can better ensure that she will use that awareness, which includes rhetorical awareness of writing, in a wide range of contexts. And as a component of her developing idea, identity, this knowledge is likely to be repurposed for a longer time than she will ever repurpose meta-awareness of writing. In short, to foster broader, more lasting transfer, we need to whack with FYC. Thank you. I'm gonna hold the mic up for the people who have questions in the room. Is there anyone who has questions? Hi, uh, this is a question for Kristen. Um, <laughs> Hi, Kristen. So, hey. <laughs> um, could you? Thank you very much for your talk, by the way. Uh, um, could you uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, the tension between analysis analysis and synthesis and concision? Like, it was yeah. like one of your last slides. I, because, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> in the intro. Yeah, that, that would just kind of like bloom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, I was, uh, I didn't want to like talk for too long, but yeah, that's a, a great question. Thanks. Like, so I think a lot of the times when we, when we think about analysis or students think about it and talk about it, they say, oh, 
you know, my instructor uh, pushed me to, to go in more depth on this or analyze this more, right? So analysis often has like um, a sense, you know, for students who are kind of grappling with that as a skill set as they need to kind of keep saying more, unpacking it more, go into more detail, right? At the same time, um, in the sciences, they would have, you know, maybe 50 to 200 words to do that. So mm -hmm. it became really challenging for many of the students to kind of know, okay, how do I explore um, this idea and pinpoint, you know, my contribution in depth while also maintaining the requirements of, you know, the genre's word limits. Do yeah. you think it's going to be addressed by, um, I don't know, more familiarity, say, with the terminology? Is that what we're talking um, about? I think it's, I think it's more familiarity with, like, genre actually and almost looking at okay like this is the genre that you're trying to do that on here are some samples what are the kinds of modes of analysis that are happening how does that translate to your own work I think mm -hmm. the terminal scientific terminology piece of kind of what I was think what I was thinking about and sharing is more where uh, what students got tripped up with in terms of um, when they were first reading and trying to digest scientific articles. Yeah. Um, in the case of like not understanding even the experiments and um, you know just what was being discussed, and then like if you're in a journal club or if you're supposed yeah. to be discussing points about it and you don't understand the terminology, it, it can be, it can feel very alienating. Um, sure. So one of the students was saying that her strategy to work through that, which is something she just created on her own, but I thought it was a really good idea, was she kept a running Google Doc of all scientific terms that she'd mm -hmm. encountered in her class. Mm -hmm. And like, she would separate it by like, okay, these are the different experiments I've read about. Um, and this was the purpose of those experiments in this mm -hmm. context, right? And then when, even when, when proposing her own experiment or something, at least she had a couple of, um, you know, models to draw on right. uh, that way. So, right. okay. so right. I, I feel like the genre and the reading piece are kind of separate, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very great. much. Hello, um, this is Alan from um, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, I have a question for um, Jerry. Um, it is because I'm also very interested in learning transfer. So um, I just want to know uh, if you can share with us maybe one or two concrete um, in-class activities or tasks that you did with your students um, in order to raise their matter awareness and also help them see um, the value of writing in various situations. Yeah, um, the, there's a reason this remains a bit theoretical is because um, teaching in a particular program, you know, you you have to kind of follow the rules and and ours especially, it's a long, complicated explanation, but we have these portfolio groups where you meet with other instructors who grade your class. So we, we do group grading. So we kind of have to kind of stick very closely to what what's the existing structure and it, it doesn't really go this direction quite yet. But I would say one of the things that I do is I have I have tried increasingly to link the class to um, specific activities outside the class. So what I mean is I don't I'm, I have increasingly moved away from trying to teach my class as a class about writing. Right. Like we may you'll hear a lot of transfer uh, scholars and theorists rightfully say that writing is very rhetorical, it's very context dependent. But then to me, there's a disconnect. Then we think we can teach rhetorical writing that applies everywhere. And I don't find that that's really very effective. What I want to do is make my class an instance of some other activity or some other situation they encounter beyond the, the class. One of the, given the constraints of my, my program at the moment, one of the ways I do that is I, I tie the class very much to public writing. Um, so I make it very much about the public discourse and, and taking some kind of action in the public. So I try to link it to some sort of 
concern or consideration or, or something very important to the student that requires a kind of public facing text. Um, and we, we try to accomplish that goal that they they care about. So for instance, a lot of students are really upset about parking in, um, at the university. So the parking matters to you. Okay. How do you make that matter to everybody else? Who do you need to talk to? What genres do you need to address? So that we're not trying to develop a meta awareness about all kinds of writing situations, uh, but rather we're trying to develop meta awareness about this thing that you care about very, very much and that you're motivated to pursue long enough to do something like, uh, as you were saying, Kristen, make a list of all the terms like that's somebody's very motivated to acquire that discourse. I want my students aren't motivated to learn about they don't, they don't care about writing studies. They look at me weird when I get enthusiastic about writing. So I'm trying to tie it. So, for instance, I'll have my to, to, as a concrete example, my students have to pick a, an issue on campus that they care about. And, and we, I don't even tell them they're going to write about it. We just I just have a day where I have them come in and rant. It's rant day, rant about something you hate on campus. And so they kind of get into it. And then I say, OK, now we're going to fix that problem or we're going to take a step to fixing that problem. So let's get started fixing that problem. And we inevitably come upon the need to communicate to somebody, because if you if you if you could fix the problem, it wouldn't be a problem. The fact that you can't fix it means you need other people, which means you have to communicate. So therefore, you have to typically communicate through some sort of rhetorical action, usually some form of writing. So then I have them take up that writing to get that object done. So it's a it's a an assignment in trying to take the next step in solving that problem. And you do whatever writing you need to do to do that. And then you write a kind of meta reflective piece on why does that writing take the form it does? Why is that the most effective way to do it? And that way the students motivated to think rhetorically because it is something they care about. I hope that makes sense. I hope I was kind of rambling there and I apologize, but. Yeah, it makes very good sense. Um, so am I right to say that um, students do not necessarily have to write something which is highly academic in the FYC course? Well, the, the way I do that is I make a public, um, I've increasingly focused, I've increasingly gotten to a point where I'm telling my students that uh, I'm stressing the point that your job that you get is kind of tied to a broader project in my class where I make the point you get your language from the, the, the collective, you, which, which psychology is, you know, and various studies have shown helps us think. So you get your very thinking from the collective. So your job is to use those tools to improve the community you're a part of. And that means joining the, uh, the sort of general rational public discourse. And that's where we take up more of the academic type of writing. Uh, I do ask students to do a, uh, a bit of a discourse analysis, or a, you could argue a, re, a rhetorical analysis of their own, of a discipline they want to join or a profession they want to join, and they write about that using writing terminology. They do a kind of academic study of that, but I find they're less motivated by the academic study of it than they are by learning more about the discipline or profession. So that's why I link it so closely to a discipline or profession. It's not. It's the, the point is not to write the paper, although I ask them to do that. I think of that as more of a learning genre and that they take that then and apply it to the, the discourse they want to join. So there are places where I have found to make academic writing kind of more of it, like source-based, research-based writing uh, uh, tied to things they care about. But I do like having, I especially like starting with an activity that is really just whatever kind of writing is needed do that because that's what we're here for and then that helps me justify why the academic forms are necessary in certain contexts that the student does care about again i hope that makes sense yeah it makes very good sense thank you jerry yeah thanks for the question All right, everyone, we are out of time, but thank you to our panelists for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks everyone for attending, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, bye everyone. Thank you.